Hi, and welcome to the Spooky Hours. My name is David Saunderson, and today we're talking to author and writer John Kaneko James. How are you, John? I'm very good. I'm very good. Enjoying lockdown. Are you? Well, that's, that's, that's good. I mean, a, a man like you who enjoys his books and his research must be getting quite a lot out of this. Uh, oh, there you go. You're getting a lot out of it on a, on a Sunday Absolutely. morning. This is not, this is not a, a work day. This is a Saturday. So uh, you're, you're enjoying your, uh, your red wine. Exactly. Now, uh, you have an interest in the occult. And uh, when I uh, approached you to yeah. uh, be a, a guest on our on our YouTube channel, I, I asked, could you talk about the occult in film? Because I know you've written about that uh, quite extensively and you have a, a lot of personal views about some of the films, some of the classic films we've we've seen. Uh, overall, oh, yeah, do you, totally. overall, do you think uh, the occult has ever been portrayed realistically on film? Right. Now, this is when I did think about a lot and it's one I actually wrote about in an article years and years ago because I did an article, I think it was ended up in Pig and Dawn years and years ago about the occult in film and one of the big things is it doesn't necessarily make it a good film. This is one of the things accuracy isn't shorthand for good quality um, on the other hand a lot of the time the occult isn't done well in film or at least it's not done accurately in film and I, I've just released a whole load of fiction books and I kind of came really hard into understanding why people change um, the way magic is portrayed. Because obviously having written serious history about the history of magic, about the occult, about magical books, I thought, right, this is going to be wonderful. I'm going to write a book where all of the spells are accurate to the way the proper 16th century grimoires were. And then what I found as I started doing it is that accurate 16th century grimoires are dull and they are bombastic and it doesn't work in fiction. And I tried cutting them and then all I had was dull, incoherent and bombastic. So I ended up changing it in my own work and I'm a historian of it. Um, likewise, I've spent like 24 years of my life genuinely studying this and that's why I've never been able to watch The Witch to the end, because it's brilliant. The Witch is beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of costuming. It's a beautiful bit of camera work setting. They invented a new musical instrument to play all the sounds in it. It's such a great piece of work. But as somebody who knows where it's going, the fact that it is so accurate means that I, I just get so bored with it after about 45 minutes, because it is really by the numbers of what people wrote in these manuscripts and things. So what I would say is things are not always done accurately. It's not always a bad thing. Um, one of the most accurate portrayals of all magical genre, like disciplines in film, of all things, um, with a bit of a disclaimer that I'm about to talk about an area of magic that I am not a historian of, but friends I respect and people who are experts I respect say sort of spoke to me about this is when the film of the serpent and the rainbow was made. Now, the real story of the serpent and the rainbow is about this chap who wanted to research a thing called tetrodotoxin. And so he went off to Haiti again and again. And over years and years, he researched the science of tetrodotoxin. That's not what the film The Serpent and the Rainbow is about. It's got a lot more voodoo in it. And it's actually done, I mean, not perfectly at all, but it's done very sensitively. And it is done sufficiently well that a number of the voodoo practitioners from the US I spoke to felt that it was a really good example of voodoo on film. And um, they took out the science in order to make the magic more accurate. So that's probably a good example. Okay. Um, yeah. So you're saying that uh, the occult in film would not necessarily be entertaining as much as it would be to watch uh, maybe one of the more boring Christian church services sermons that we, you know, have all grown up listening to at certain times of our lives. Is that, is that a, a similar connection there? Oh, yeah, totally. And I mean, with the little proviso again, that there are so many different magical practices in the world. And so, you know, there are, I've, I've 
been lucky enough to be invited to take part in some amazing pagan ceremonies, which would be really interesting to watch, but not in the way that these films are necessarily trying to do. Because, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like sort of, if the music is wonderful, if it's beautiful, if it's great, then you're still kind of watching songs of praise, not a horror film, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the things about it. Yeah, it, it would be much more religious anthropology than, for example, a horror film as, as we're going to have a chat about today, or an action film, etc. Okay. All right, well, well let, let's start with the one that first comes to my mind, and I suppose a lot of people will think of uh, Dennis Wheatley's The Devil Rides Out, a Hammer film from the 1960s, because that, that does have a lot of, you know, people within pentagrams and, you know, fighting, you know, goats, oh, and yeah. all sorts of stuff like that. Tell, tell us about, what is it about that film that you either like, you don't like, or you are indifferent to? Oh, my God. That film, I've got so many emotions about that film. Um, it prompted one of the most successful articles I've ever written. But it's, it's got this amazing scene in it where Christopher Lee picks up a book. No, the other actor, whose name I can't remember, Rex Van Ryan is my name, might be, picks up a book. And was he looks Charles at it. Gray? Was it Charles Gray? No, it's the other protagonist. The one who isn't the character Simon. So is it and Paul Eddington? That's it. it. His... Yeah, Paul Eddington. Yeah, okay. And so he picks up a book and he looks faintly bemused. And then sort of Christopher Lee picks it up and looks at it. And in his grave, wonderful Christopher Lee way, he says, yes, human skin. And I, I loved it. But I did do a bit, a lot of research after that in Books Bound in Human Skin. And of course, what I found is you can't pick up a book and touch it and go, oh, human skin, unless it's got like a tattoo on it that says I love mum. Yeah. Um, so it, it has its melodramatic moments. Um, it's got a lot of kind of interesting stuff that is accurate by osmosis. So, for example, there is a bit in it where they go into MacArthur's... Well, no, it's not MacArthur's ritual chamber. It's the ritual chamber in the character Simon's house. And anyway, they go in, and then you have this demon who is actually uh, just this kind of actor who's like a black bodybuilder with sort of contacts in. And the idea... I mean, I've, I've written a whole article about it on my blog, by the way. The portrayal of sort of demons as... Um, in inverted commas, Ethiopians, which is a kind of medieval term. And by the way, I do not uh, say this as like a modern thing. This is not a worldview. This is an ex a piece of history. But that portrayal within the Western um, sort of hermetic demonological tradition, that is very accurate. Um, it even has, at least in the film version, entire lines, the Susama ritual which is, you know, the Count de Richelieu's kind of big magical whammy. That is actually a thing that lots and lots of um, practitioners like myself, also lots of people who are pagans will know, called the lesser banishing of the pentagram ritual. Now, it's not an unbelievably powerful doomsday ritual. It's the sort of thing you do just in the morning. However, um, it is, that again is accurate. But, um, yeah, and a lot of it, though, is kind of it's deliberately blurred around the edges in order to make it more interesting to watch. Uh, yeah, the, the, go on. I was going to say, have you ever had to uh, put together any kind of ritual like that to protect yourself from a demon like they do in the film? Have to stand between the, you know, within the the pentagram or whatever they had. To, it was a lot of action involved there, wasn't there, that might not necessarily oh, happen in real life? Oh, there totally was. And, I mean, if you look at... I mean, look, again, everything I say, I'm not going to say it every time I say something, but for the rest of this interview, every time I make what sounds like a definitive statement, people out there who are listeners, obviously there's a last risk that your practice may vary and that yeah. there are many traditions in the world. But So to avoid me having to say this again and again. However... If we look at the Western tradition that is portrayed in The Devil Rides Out, demon summoning within that tradition, it's a bit like getting a Formula One car going. 
you don't jump into a Formula One car and just twist the key. You need a huge team of people. You need to be ready. Um, if you ever want to know how hard it is to make a Formula One car go, watch a video from top your Richard Hammond trying to just start one. It's so hard, and a lot of the time you turn the key and nothing happens. And that is what Western Hermetic Demon Summoning is like. It takes a huge amount of team. You've, if you look at the magic circles for them, they've got like positions for like four or five people to stand in. They take huge amounts of effort. Um, in the real world, outside of the world of Charles Gray and Christopher Lee's antics, nobody has that much energy to, for me. Like, okay. in, at the end of the day, I don't think I'm capable of pissing anyone else off to the point where they're prepared to give up meat for potentially three months, drink only water, donate to charity, and go off to pray in the woods every couple of hours. And so... So for the, for the, from the recharge, we'll get whatever powers that they're claiming to have in this film. They would have to do a lot of work to get to where they are. Oh, yeah, crumbs, yes. But that is kind of... One of the things, actually, I like it for, because it implies that, you know, MacArthur lives off his servants. Not his servants, his um, parishioners, so to speak. And if all you were doing was being MacArthur, then you could probably do all that. This is the thing, MacArthur, if all he ever does is get up and do, like, magic, well, yeah. It's a bit like Casting the Runes, where it's more explicit, where the villain in Casting the Runes specifically says, you know, my followers pay for all this. Okay, well, and so, actually, it's yeah. we, 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 you're calling it Castle of Ruins, but of course you're talking about Nine of the Demon, which is Sorry, based on yes. which is which yes, is based yes, on yes. M.R. James' uh, story, and uh, yeah. which we were going to go into that anyway. You've sort of jumped the gun there, but so it, let, let let us let us talk about Nine of the Demon because, as you say, that is right. That's very similar in some respects. Uh, M.R. James is obviously a, an academic, so he you know did lots of research into what he uh, what he you know, wrote and uh, his ghost stories are the some of the best in the English language. Oh, yeah. how how was it though for uh, realism and the occult? Um, now the 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 story casting of the runes is a lot more realistic, um, partially because M.R. James was in his own right, pardon me, an eminent medieval historian. He was an expert in things like. Uh, the Law of the Undead and that sort of thing. He actually wrote a really serious and beautiful translation of a set of North English Latin ghost stories that's known as the Bylands Manuscript. And that is James, James's, M.R. James is the main translator of that. And so at the end of the day, the M.R. James story, it's great. However, also the M.R. James story, most of the action, if it was filmed, would be middle-age academics kind of pawing each other in corridors. Because that's kind of the, one of the main thrusts of the atmosphere. It's people like lying in bed going, oh, God, this is scary, uh, which is a bit of a James theme. And then people kind of palming things into each other's pockets in corridors. Hands, yeah, yeah. And you couldn't necessarily, or rather, you could possibly film it if you did it in a Hitchcock way, but you can see that Night of the Demon didn't want that. Night of the Demon wanted Daring Do. Night of the Demon has, it, unless I'm really wrong, has the actor who would eventually play Foggy Dewhurst um, as a catatonic farmer who jumps out of a window. Okay, I, I know the character. I don't know who you're referring to, but I do remember the fellow that jumps out the window, so... Yeah, uh, well, he later went on to be in a very, very well-known British sitcom called Last of the Summer Wine. Okay. Where uh, he and he to me is that guy, so it's always a bit of a thing when I see that guy, like as a catatonic farmer in a horror film. But that it's again, it makes a lot of sacrifices for the sort of the sake of good theatre, so to speak, good cinema. It does keep the central device of the little written curse, yep. which is kind of. That is, within reason, very accurate. You can still sort of see that variation in both magic that is beneficial and negative. Uh, there's a thing you get in a lot of Christian mythology. Not many of them survive, sadly, called periapts. Well, I say mythology, but anyway, uh, in Christian sort of mystical traditions called periapts, 
mm. and periapts are like little written charms that people wear but because of what they're made of they don't survive very much but so that's very accurate but and the wonderful scene with the spiritualists from a certain perspective is accurate although i will say it's very reductive okay. but i do love the bit where they sing cherry ripe <laughs> So it, it sounds like from what you're telling me that a lot of the – you don't seem that fussed about the fact that people are taking liberties with some of this stuff because it's, it, it makes entertainment as opposed to reading a, a boring – watching something, people reciting, reading out enchant, enchantments and stuff like that, which aren't particularly interesting. Is that fair to say? Pretty much. I mean, if you look at the books behind me, I have a reasonable collection of actual textbooks on the history of magic – and if I want accuracy, I'll read those. Yeah, when I sit down in front of Night of the Demon, what I want to see is Night of the Demon, if you know what I mean. So, so really, it's like saying, if you wanted it realistic, you're watching a documentary or, a, or a, an academic uh, yeah. le lecture. That, that's not going to be all that exciting. It might be if you're into that kind of thing, but it's not going to give us the kind of entertainment we might have received. In the next one we're talking about is Dr. Terror's House yeah. of Horrors with Peter Cushing. <sighs> Uh, oh my god i don't know what we're even I, talking about this because i can't imagine there's much uh realism in this but maybe you uh maybe you can tell us more there's not a huge amount of realism it's just a film that i i love with all my heart and it has sort of it has such right it has one of the few portrayals of a tarot reader in sort of fiction that isn't either a little bit fetishized like all the use of tarot in um, Live and Let Die with James Bond. Yeah. Or generally portrayed as a batty old woman. And one of the reasons I love it, I mean, you know, full disclosure, some of the people watching this may know this. I actually do tarot and I was a professional reader for a while. So, you know, I, I have a vested interest. It uses the Tarot de Marseille deck, which is kind of used in a lot of cinema. Also, it's good because it's out of copyright. And I like it just because of the power it imbues in kind of Dr. Terror in the, the Peter Cushing character. Um, on a side note, by the way, I once for a charity event, uh, I cosplayed as Dr. Terror, <laughs> which was a big mistake because it was in a really hot, very expensive nightclub. Um, and Dr. Terror is dressed entirely head to toe in heavy wool because it takes place on a freezing cold train. Um, and I nearly died that night. However, did, did, any, did anyone even realize what you were doing? No, God, no. It just no. looked like it was like it was, I was, it was know, a self indulgent on your part, and it was fun, but yeah, it wasn't the right thing to yeah. do. So, so you're but saying this is what, one of the few, few instances where it basically it's not a little old woman or a gypsy type woman going that kind of stuff. You, it, was, it was a bloke who had a bit of, you know. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and I like it because one of the things about Paro is building a story. And although, obviously, right, I have never done a reading for somebody where I was like, oh, yeah, and vines are going to eat your house and a hand is going to come back and, and like, murder you. Um, by the way, forgive me, everybody, if I've remembered something from a different Pomanto horror. But anyway, you know, I, I've never sentenced Roy Castle to death. However, the way that you build a story in tarot is re you could see the story. I love the idea of doing a bunch of readings for people and somebody filming the stories that come out of the cards coming to life. And so that's why I like it. Um, and generally, it's just, as I say, they obviously do the one that everybody does wrong, which is the death card. Because, of course, the death card, it means change. It is, it's now, by the way, an anti-cliche. Because, of course, everybody now knows, oh, well, the death card doesn't mean change. Mm. Which is why I love the Simpsons episode where you have the happy squirrel. Mm. Which, by the way, has ended up in a couple of tarot card decks that are sold for real, just as a joke. <laughs> uh, I've, there are several decks on the market, uh, don't ask me to think of them now, that have the happy squirrel in them. And so I love that with all my heart. So do, are there other films that where there is tarot used in a... Again, again, from what you're telling me, essentially all this is just 
use from whenever it, to make an entertaining film. And no, oh, one yeah, really, no one really wants to see someone watch and do a tarot reading where they're going to talk about change or this, or you, you know, give us almost a counseling session in respect to what the oh, yeah. person is going to do. Because they want, you know, dum, 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 card goes down, it's a death card. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, the person gets hit by a bus. That's yeah, what we exactly. Want, you know? so we're talking horror films here. We're not talking something that's not going to involve, you know, death and horror and blood and guts. Oh, yeah, totally. Right, now, I had to think about this. You see, one of the big things about when you see kind of tarot cards in a lot of films, they are literally in the most physical way props. They are usually enablers for a fortune teller oracle character. And that's kind of why I like Dr. Terror's House of Horror, because that is about the tarot cards. It is about a tarot reader. Whereas all the other time, you have the kind of, you know, the oracle character, usually a woman, very often these days a very sexualized character, very often somebody who is fetishized sort of from a non-Western culture. And then, so you have all of that built up and it's not really about the cards. So most, that's kind of one of the reasons why I pick out Dr. Terror's House of Horror, because at the very least it's about the cards. Do you have any particular films you think people should watch if they are interested in looking for something that's a bit more realistic? Is that possible? Because you've, you've kind of told us that none of these films are realistic, but you don't really want realistic because it's get a bit boring. Yeah. Is I, oh, yeah. Um, 100%. Anyone who is interested in this stuff, watch The Witch. The Witch is and that's the most, not you, that's my the most re, That's the most recent one. We're talking about The Witch that's got the two Vs put together, The Witch. That's the one. Yeah. It's like 2016, I think. And yeah. that film, it's not, as I say, it's not my bag, but it is beautifully done. It is incredibly accurate. If you watch that, you are set up to go off and then do some quite serious research. In fact, because I, my day job is the Globe Theatre, from which I'm on furlough right now. And, but I have colleagues who are sort of experts in early modern clothing. And one of the things they all commented is they were really astounded at how accurate some of the clothing is. And so anyone who wants a good start in that sort of thing, the witch, totally. Okay. We'll have to see it. I mean, you've, you've just kind of said it was boring you in the first 45 minutes, but maybe that's because you know more than we do. And that's well, that's because it's buried by the numbers for its source material. And I've got friends who are historians who are like, oh, no, but that's why I love it. But for me... I kind of, because it's very by the numbers, because it's very faithful to this very homogenous narrative that you get in witchcraft persecution materials, I'm a bit like, okay, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, now this is going to be said. Um, and so that's kind of why I find it dull. It's sort of, it's, it's, you know it's you going to happen, so there's no yeah, excitement. Exactly. Or or that. So, okay, well, I won't yeah. know that, so I, I will watch it. Now, oh, yeah, you're you're totally sure. So what are you what are you doing to keep yourself busy during furlough, as you've just said? What are you what, what are you what are you working on, and what can we look forward to? You've, you've had some books coming out recently. Uh, I what, totally have. Tell tell us what's going on. Well, I've got my urban fantasy series, uh, which is called the Five Stages of Magic. The first book of that, called Bar the Gates, is on Amazon now. The second book, uh, Dying of the Light, is on pre order, and it's out on the twenty eighth of May. And there's going to be one every two months through till the start of 2021. Um, I'm writing some sequels to it at the moment. Uh, if anyone's on Folk Horror Revival, they might have seen some of my weird artwork that's been going up. And I've been making a lot of kind of folk horror-y Photoshop-related art. Okay. And I've been enjoying that. Oh, yeah. Check it out. And you're on Facebook with me. So have a little look on my Facebook. Facebook and if on any the folk, uh, folk revival, what would you call it? Folk uh, horror folk revival. Folk horror revival. It's a wonderful yeah. list. Yeah, I'm, I'm a member of that as well. So we'll, we're going to all have a look at that. So, all right. Oh, yeah, and, totally. And what we'll do is we'll put your links in the in the description to your books and uh, to oh, uh, uh, people should check out John's, uh, his website. There's lots of stuff on there. You've written about oh, some yeah. of these, you've written about some of these things. And I think you referred to having written about a, a cult in film before for some other website, but it was actually for us and the articles are in the link down the bottom because I think uh, you remember you or you've got I'm afraid one. I've two timed you because I've written for it about it for other people as well. So yes, right. but I have done it for you too. 
Okay, all right. Yes. You're lucky I don't know any curses because you'd be cursed right now. So, all right, that's all good. Okay, well, thanks very much for that, John. You take care. Oh, you've you, got, obviously, Thank you've you. got lots and lots of things to, to do and you're certainly not going to be bored during follow. And uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you again on another subject another time. Thank you, David. Thank you for See having you me. Have See a good ya. one. Take care, Bye -bye. mate. Bye-bye.